Well, for uh, several weeks now, you have endured the challenging recitation of Matthew's record of the genealogy of Jesus. For one final reading, I invite you to stand now in reverence for the Holy Word as we listen to a video recording of Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac he had Jacob, Jacob he had Judah and his kin. Then Perez and Zerah came from Judah's woman Tamar. Perez he brought Hezron up and then came Aram, then Amenadab, then Nashan, who was then the dad of Salmon, who with Rahab fathered Boaz. Ruth, she married Boaz, who had Obed, who had Jesse. Jesse, he had David, who we know as king. David, he had Solomon by dead Uriah's wife. Solomon, well, you all know him. He had good old Rehoboam, followed by Abijah, who had Asa. Asa had Jehoshaphat, had Joram, had Isaiah, who had Jotham, then Ahaz, then Hezekiah. Followed by Manasseh, who had Amon, who was a man, who was father of a good boy named Josiah, who grandfather Jehoiakim, who caused the Babylonian captivity because he was a liar. And then he had Shealtiel, who begat Zerubbabel, who had Abiud, who had Eliakim, Eliakim had Azer, who had Zadok, who had Achim, Achim was the father of Eliab then. He had Eliezer, who had Nathan, who had Jacob. Now listen very closely, I don't want to sing this twice. Jacob was the father of Joseph, husband of Mary, mother of Christ. You may be seated. I thought reading it was challenging enough. I was not about to try to sing that. Well, for the past five weeks, uh, we've been looking behind the begats and considering the names and the stories associated with the ancestors of Jesus. Who begat Jesus? Of course, at the core of the gospel is the irrefutable claim that Jesus was, in the words of the Nicene Creed, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with God. The Father. That being settled, the question or focus this morning is who begat you? Paul Harvey wrote a column some years ago with that same title, Who Begot You? Harvey writes the most boring verses in the Holy Bible are the first 16 verses of the Gospel of Matthew. All those begats, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah, on and on and on for 42 generations of begats. Yet, Harvey is writing here, a pastor in Mansfield, Ohio, the Reverend Clifford Skuja, built his Sunday sermon around those verses and ultimately, effectively. 
The tedious recitation, recitation of the lineage of Jesus, however boring to us, was of deep concern to the Hebrews because of their powerful sense of history and their hunger for understanding where we all are in the stream of things. Pastor Scooter promptly made his point. He said, all the history and all the people and all the world up to right now has been for the purpose of producing me. Pastor Scooter said, I am the sum of all of the life. I am the climax of all the history which preceded me. And here I sit watching cartoons on TV. <laughs> of course, his sermon went on from there to challenge himself and all of us to be better stewards of our time and our opportunities. Well, I don't know what Scooter and Harvey would think if they discovered that you good folks endured the entire four weeks of the season of Advent listening to sermons based on the genealogy of Christ. I mean, even I was surprised to learn the significance of these oft-neglected verses. Well, I return to Raymond Brown and his masterful commentary uh, on which I have primarily uh, relied. Brown writes, more than anything else, this lineage of promise and fulfillment stresses the all-powerful grace of God. Perhaps the genealogy presents its greatest challenge to those who will accept only an idealized ancestry of Jesus Christ, whose story they would write only with straight lines and whose portrait they would only paint with pastel colors. But if we look at the whole story and the total picture, the genealogy teaches us that just isn't true. The forebearers of Jesus Christ included an odd assortment of idolaters, murderers, liars, thieves, incompetents, power seekers, betrayers, and incorrigibles. And yet, that lesson is not a discouragement. Instead, this great litany of names is an ageless encouragement to each one of us. It is the lasting reminder that God's grace can work through people like you and me. The grace of God, the power of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. From generation to generation, it's passed along from person to person. Now, you might remember how a few weeks ago I told you about a lineage of faith that could be traced over the course of a century. From Edward Kimball to Dwight L. Moody to Frederick B. Meyer to Wilbur Chapman to Billy Sunday to Mordecai Ham to Billy Graham. From an elderly, forgotten Boston Sunday school teacher to a global evangelist who preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to some 215 million people who attended one of his more than 400 crusades and rallies in more than 185 countries and territories around the globe. Now, a similar story took place during the early years of the 1700s. Elizabeth Scatliff was a gentle, caring mother whose life was tragically short-lived. 
Little is known of her early days except that she and her husband were members of the old Gravel Lane Independent Meeting House. Now, they were, in fact, Baptists. Her son, John, later described his mother as a pious woman of a weak constitution. Elizabeth, in fact, suffered from tuberculosis, the disease that would eventually claim her life. Though Elizabeth was unable to function as she might have wished, she did not squander her days. Knowing that time with her son might be short, she determined to make the most of her days. She took on the role of teacher and spent hours with John each day. John later wrote, as I was her only child, she made it the chief business and pleasure of her life to instruct me and bring me up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Based on her son's quick mind and easy grasp of theology, Elizabeth prayed and hoped that God would call John into the ministry. Sadly, Elizabeth would not live to see that day. By early 1732, her disease had advanced and she succumbed to tuberculosis at the age of 27. Her son, John Newton, a man who would rebel against God, a man who would scorn the values of Scripture, a man who would dismiss the lessons of childhood, a man who would commit horrifying atrocities. There was a callous spirit in his heart with thought and regard for no one and nothing except himself and the satisfaction of his own pleasures. But later, John Newton would experience God's transforming power and become a preacher, a hymn writer, and abolitionist. We heard his story a couple of weeks ago. He would tell his own story and the story of every Christian in his most famous song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When John looked back on his life, he was quick to give the credit to his mother. He knew his eventual, his eventual salvation was inseparable from the early training he had received at her knee and from the many prayers that she had prayed on his behalf. He wrote, Though I had sinned away all the advantages of these early impressions, yet they remained for a great while as a restraint upon me. They returned again and again until I could shake them off no longer. But the Lord at length opened my eyes and I found a great benefit from the recollection of them. Elizabeth, he said, had stored in my memory, which was then very ret ret retentive, with many valuable pieces, chapters, and portions of Scripture. Among the thousands whom John Newton led to Jesus Christ was a young man by the name of Thomas Scott, a cultured, selfish, self-satisfied man. He had little religious orientation. He went to a several small schools, was apprenticed as at 15 to a surgeon, but as a ne'er-to-well, Thomas Scott was soon dismissed for bad conduct. He returned to the family farm in disgrace and reduced to working as a laborer on his father's farm. 
But through a correspondence with John Newton, Scott was introduced to the Savior. And giving his heart to Christ, he became a persuasive witness and a prolific author of books and pamphlets explaining the power of God's love. His commentary on the Bible issued in weekly numbers between 1788 and 1792, had a huge circulation in the London Gazette. Scott was, in fact, an excellent journalist and scholar, finding a timely message in each section of the Bible, and he persistently refused to shirk difficult passages with simplistic replies. His works eventually became a standard, standard volumes of study for many in the ministry. So using both the pulpit and the pen, Scott touched the lives of many, including an intelligent but downhearted man, William Cowper. One of the greatest thinkers England ever produced, Cowper developed a brain disease and realized he was literally losing his mind. He couldn't bear the thought and decided to take his own life. He went down to the river to drown himself, but some people were there fishing, and he returned home. He went up to the attic and tied a rope around a rafter. With the other end, he tightened a noose around his neck, but the rope broke and he, as he put his weight on it. He went down to his study, took a sharp sword, stood it on end, fell upon it, but the sword broke in half. Then, seeing one of Thomas Scott's articles printed in the London newspaper, folded on his desk, Cowper read words that changed his life. Several days later, Cowper composed these lines. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessing on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him in his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Newton begat Scott. Scott begat Cowper, and it started with a mother's prayer. By the way, Thomas Scott also had significant impact on the life of William Wilberforce, the great Christian abolitionist who led the movement to abolish the slave trade in Great Britain, and William Carey, the Baptist shoemaker, now honored as the father of modern missions. Who begat you? Or perhaps the more pertinent question is, who are you begetting? What child of faith are you giving birth to? What person are you calling to new life in Christ? How is the lineage of faith and discipleship being passed on to the next generation? Who are you begetting? The story of the origin of Jesus Christ. Remember, that's how Matthew frames this genealogy. Abraham is the father of Isaac. Jesse is the father of David. Achim is the father of Eliud. 
But this isn't just history. This isn't just his story. This remarkable story concerning the origin of Jesus Christ should remind both readers and hearers that the story continues as Jesus calls Paul and as Paul calls Timothy, someone called me. Someone called you. And you and I must call someone else. Now, it is alarming to read the statistics that indicate as many as 95% of all church members have never led anyone to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. On the other hand, there are inspiring stories. Stories of people like George Whitfield, the famous English evangelist who prayed, Oh Lord, give me souls or take my soul. And Henry Martin, the missionary to India, who knelt on the coral beaches and cried out, Here, let me burn out for God. And David Brainerd, one of America's most celebrated missionaries, laboring among the poor benighted Indians on the banks of the Delaware, he wrote in his journal, I care not where I live. I care not what hardships I may endure but that I may gain souls for Christ. While I am asleep, I dream of these things. And as soon as I awake, the first thing I think of is this great work. All my desire is the conversion of those Christ loves. And all my hope is in God. Who are you begetting? You know, this wonder and miracle of procreation involves love and passion and waiting and labor and sweat and a whole lot more. But what joy fills every parent's heart when the child is born and new life begins. Begotten and begetting. Who are you begetting? At the threshold of this new year, 2023, may the Spirit of God bring to each of us the name, the face, the life of one person to whom we can introduce to Jesus Christ. So that after our names, like those who bore us, there may be added the words such as this, and of Pastor Bud, and of Pastor Jeff, and of him, and of her, and of you, was born another child of God. Let us pray. And may this be your prayer. Let me burn out for thee, dear Lord. Burn and wear out for thee. Don't let me rust or my life be a failure, my God, to thee. Use me and all I have, dear Lord, and hold me so close to thee that I feel the throb of the great heart of God until I burn out for thee. Amen. We're going to sing a 
Christmas song that reminds us of the opportunity before us to share the good news with others. We're going to stand together as we sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. familiar with the story of Christ's birth when we look at the Gospels of Matthew as well as Luke. But there are two other renderings of the birth of Jesus Christ. One is found from the pen of the Apostle Paul. In his letter to the Philippians, he tells the Christmas story in this way. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 